Hello and welcome back. First, let me thank all the supporters on Steady. Today's topic is about two important theorems in measure theory, namely the Radon Nicodym theorem and Lebesgue's decomposition theorem. Both you find in measure theory, but also in a lot of applications. For this reason, I want to give you here a short summary of them. Both theorems you can formulate in a very general sense by just using a measure space as we know it. So you have a set X, a sigma algebra A and a measure mu. However, here I want to start with the most important special case first, which is the Lebesgue measure on the real number line. This means now that X is indeed R, A is the Borel sigma algebra for R, and mu is the Lebesgue measure and I will denote that now with lambda. Please recall the Lebesgue measure is the unique measure that sends an interval to its normal length, so b minus a. Before we can formulate both theorems, we need two definitions first. For this I need another measure and I will call it mu again because yeah, mu is free because we don't use mu here. So in other words, I could say there was a lambda from the beginning. It just makes the whole notation easier. So mu is another measure, so defined on the Borel sigma algebra and then it lands into zero infinity, where we both include. For everything that now follows, it's always good to think in the following way mu is the actual measure we are interested in and lambda, the Lebesgue measure, is just a reference measure. This means that we look how the measure mu acts with respect to the given Lebesgue measure. And there we find now two important definitions. We call mu absolutely continuous if the measurement with mu is not finer than the measurement with the Lebesgue measure. What I mean by that is the following. If you measure a set A with lambda and you get out this set has a length of zero, then you also get out that the measure with respect to mu is also zero. In short, sets with lambda measure zero have also mu measure zero. Of course we want that this implication holds for all sets, so I have to add here that this holds for all sets in the Borel sigma algebra, which is our chosen sigma algebra here. However, as I said in the beginning, you can generalize everything here if you choose another measure instead of the Lebesgue measure as a reference measure. To be non-ambiguous, I should add here with respect to the Lebesgue measure. Okay, so the term absolutely continuous is always to be understood with respect to a given reference measure. Only in this case, when we have the Lebesgue measure as a reference measure, we can omit this. Please remember now, a new measure mu is called absolutely continuous when all the sets that the reference measure sends to zero are also sent to zero by our new measure mu. However, of course, it's also allowed that mu sends more than these sets to zero. Now, there is a short notation for this. One writes usually mu and there lambda. So if you see this symbol for measures, you know it means just absolutely continuous. One way I remember the symbol is the error here in the definition goes the same way as the error here in the symbol. Now you can immediately think of some examples here. You could just choose mu as lambda itself. Then this implication is obviously fulfilled. So you can say lambda is absolutely continuous with respect to lambda. Yeah, so no surprise here. The Lebesgue measure is absolutely continuous. Another easy example would be just the zero measure. Then this is also fulfilled, so the zero measure is also absolutely continuous. 
Okay, now the second definition. And this is the notion of a singular measure. It tells you that the measure mu and the reference measure, which is the Lebesgue measure, are in some sense disjoint. More concretely, it means that we find a measurable set n, so n in the Borel sigma algebra, such that the Lebesgue measure of this set is zero, so it has a length of zero, and the length of the complement of n measured with the new measure mu is also zero. Please recall the complement is always the set x without n, so here our set r without n. In the same way as for absolutely continuous, you immediately recognize that also the term singular has something to do with sets with measure zero. Also, you see, we could generalize this notion by using another reference measure, but then we have to add this in the definition. Hence, we would say the measure is singular with respect to lambda. However, as I mentioned before, usually we will omit this when we deal with the Lebesgue measure as a reference measure. Also here we use a symbol to denote a singular measure and we use the orthogonal symbol. So mu would be orthogonal to lambda. Uh, but it means just being singular with respect to lambda. Now here you already know one good example, namely the Dirac measure at the point zero, which means it sends the set that only contains one element, namely zero, to one. And also all other sets that contain zero are sent to the measure one. However, if the set does not contain zero, it is sent to zero. Hence, here we see immediately the Dirac measure in zero is singular with respect to our Lebesgue measure. To show this, we only have to choose such an n. And you see, a good choice would be, again, just a set that contains zero. Obviously, the Lebesgue measure here is zero, and also the complement measured in mu, which is now delta zero, is also zero. Now, with these two notions in our back, we are now able to formulate, to state, the two theorems I promised you at the beginning. Still, besides the Lebesgue measure, we consider another measure defined on the Borel sigma algebra of R. Now part A tells us that for this mu, we find two other related measures. Moreover, they are uniquely determined by the following. First, the names are chosen appropriately. The first one is called mu with index AC, and the second one is called mu with index S. Both live on the same sigma algebra, which is here chosen as the Borel sigma algebra. Okay, we have the measures. Therefore, the properties follow. The first one is mu is given as the sum of both measures, where mu ac is absolutely continuous and mu s is singular. That's the reason we chose the given indices as the names. Hence, this theorem tells us now if we have one measure mu given, we can uniquely decompose it into one absolutely continuous measure and one singular measure. We always find these two parts in a measure and we can always decompose it. Therefore, this is known as Lebesgue's decomposition theorem. And the second part of our theorem here will be now obviously the radon nicodium theorem. However, it only makes sense with the first part because we relate with the part that is absolutely continuous. The theorem now states that there is a measurable map that we call H. As always, the domain should be the set X, but here we show it as the real numbers. And we map into the non-negative numbers. And now the property is that we can rewrite the absolutely continuous part from A by using an integral for the Lebesgue measure lambda. 
Inside our integral we have our function h and there we have the Borel set a. And of course this should hold for all Borel sets a. And that's the Radon Nikodym theorem. It is very beautiful because it tells you if you have an absolutely continuous measure, you can always rewrite this as a usual integral with respect to the Lebesgue measure. Because we always find such a function h to rewrite this into an integral. Hence the measure is immediately much easier because you can deal with it by looking at a normal function h instead of the abstract measure. In other words, giving such a function h is as good as giving an absolutely continuous measure. And for this reason we call such an h a density function. Okay, maybe that's good enough for this quick summary of the Radon Nikodym theorem and Lebesgue's decomposition theorem. However, if you already knew these two theorems before, you should have spotted that I omitted one important detail here. Namely, you are not allowed to choose the measure mu in complete generality. We have to choose a measure that is, like the Lebesgue measure, at least sigma finite. Okay, the definition of sigma finite I gave in other videos before, but I will come back to this in the next videos. Here you should just remember that we need the sigma finiteness for our measure mu, but also for the reference measure, which is of course fulfilled for the Lebesgue measure. However, if you want to generalize both theorems with another reference measure, you have to choose one that is also sigma finite. Okay, so in the next videos I will come back to both theorems and we'll talk about the proofs and we'll also give you some examples and some applications. I can already tell you that we have a lot of applications in stochastics. That is true for both notions that we defined and both theorems. Therefore I hope we meet again in the next videos. So have a nice day. Bye.